Well, guys, welcome to the Pulse of Miami Church. Um, I don't think I have to introduce myself. I think I'm familiar with everybody here. And um, so I wanted to welcome you. Today is our second week. <laughs> Today is our second week in the book of Matthew, in the New Testament. Okay, I know you guys were excited about the New Testament. Tammy, excited about the New Testament? All right. So uh, today I want to ask the question, how do I stay on the right path? This is the question that I want us to ask the text today. How do I stay on the right path? And some of us here recently have said yes to Jesus Christ and we've experienced being on the right path and then, and then you find yourself all of a sudden you like wake up one day and you're like way off on the wrong path somewhere and it's like, how did I get here? How do I stay on the right path? How many of you guys saw the movie Up? Anybody see the movie Up? I love the dogs in that, in that movie. That was the best part of the movie. And they had that little device that you could actually hear what they're thinking. And what I loved is no matter whether they were the good dogs or the bad dogs, their master would tell them to, to go do a task. And they would start going on the task. And then all of a sudden it would be like, squirrel, right? <laughs> they would see a squirrel and they would just forget everything that they were supposed to do. And all the guys in here, you guys are familiar with that because your wife will send you to the, the grocery store to pick up like one item and then you see something shiny and then you forget everything that you were supposed to do at the store. Oh, I got to give her a call and then she gets annoyed. Why do I have to tell you five times? Oh, that doesn't happen to you? Maybe it's just me. All right. But, but that's what life is like. Sometimes you're on the right path, but then you get distracted. And I don't know if you've noticed, but these days, it's really easy to get distracted. I mean, the, the very first part is just our culture of technology is such a distraction to us. I was actually watching, uh, uh, <laughs> they had this documentary. It was like this tribe out in like South America somewhere, and they had like nothing. And so they went out there like beforehand with like, you know, uh, video equipment just to see how their life was like. And then they decided to bring them the internet by like satellite link. And so it's like, then they brought the cameras back after they had had internet for literally one week, right? And, uh, and, and this relatively happy town, like, you know, tribe in the middle of nowhere, they were all like on their phones like, and nobody was doing any work and it became a crisis like nobody had anything to eat and finally the, the people, the, 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 the chiefs got together and they said alright we're turning the internet off for the majority of the day. You can have one hour of internet and think about that. This, these are grown people that they're having to tell them you, we're restricting your internet access to one hour a week. And so imagine there's, there's nobody in our lives to turn off the internet. And you're sitting there, and whether it's TikTok or Facebook, uh, I don't know what else to get people get on. Little, the little games, there's YouTube, there's so many ways to get distracted. And if you finally do a purge, you also live in Miami. And there's always something going on. Either there's something going on at work, there's something going on with your family, there's some event happening somewhere. And so there's things that distract us and that's how we get off the right path. So how do I stay on the right path? How many of you guys have ever done any off-roading? Taken like a, an ATV or a truck or a Jeep off-road, okay? One of the things that you find, so, so a lot of people have not. The one of the things that you'll find, especially if you go out um, and it's muddy, Sometimes you don't want to go in the rut. You know where the rut is? The rut is where everybody else has gone before you and they've kind of worn out the tracks. And if it's really muddy, the last place that you want to be is in the rut because it's been dug out and you're probably going to get stuck. But anybody who's done any off-roading will know this, that you... When you don't want to be in the rut and you try to drive outside of the rut, you go, oh, this is simple. Just don't drive in the rut and I won't get stuck. What always happens? <laughs> Everything about the vehicle, gravity, 
the vehicles, engineering, like everything is sucking you back into that rut. And it's frustrating. And for most of us, that's what our habits are like, our old habits. And sometimes you're on the right path and you go, okay, no more old habits. But every fiber of your being is trying to pull you back into those old habits. Old habits like overeating or eating the wrong things. Drinking too much. Taking substances that, that, that are not good for you. Pornography addiction. I know, but it's the adult service, so. And, and I know that I've mentioned that a lot of times, but you know why I've had to mention that so many times? It's not like I could say that one time in church and then we're all like, okay, we're good. Like Pastor Todd said, don't, don't look at porn. <laughs> and then it's like not a problem anymore. No, no, it's going to be a problem. Why? Because we're used to going into it and it, it sucks us back in. So how can I stay on the right path when I keep falling into all of my old habits? How many of you guys like uh, the Cheesecake Factory? Anybody like going to the Cheesecake Factory? I hate the Cheesecake Factory. And, and there's nothing, look, they, they make good food. I, I actually love my wife very much, and one of the things that I love to do is I love to take my wife out to eat. But there's one part of that process that I absolutely hate, okay? Every time, they will hand us the menu, they'll give us plenty of time, but when the waiter comes around, or the waitress, they ask, what do you want? I go, well, I like this, 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 and this. My wife always acts as if it's a surprise. Like she had no idea. Oh, I didn't know I was supposed to be looking at the menu. <laughs> and she has a really hard time figuring out what she wants from the menu, okay? And that's just the way she is. But can you imagine going into Cheesecake Factory where they've got like a... a, a, a an almanac full of all the stuff that you can possibly eat. And you know what? To be honest with you, I don't blame her in Cheesecake Factory. I have a hard time making up my mind in Cheesecake Factory. And in the same way, a lot of times in life, we'll be on the right path, but there's so many paths to choose from that you don't know which one that you're supposed to be on. How do I stay on the right path? And finally, one last question. Have you guys ever heard of the, the phrase, too many chiefs and not enough Indians? Okay, that's, for, for you youngins, we usually say that when, uh, when you're working on a job somewhere and there's too many bosses and everybody wants you to do something different and there's like only one of you. That's when there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians. And a lot of us in our lives, we have a lot of people who have opinions on how we should live our lives and it's hard to know the voices that you're actually supposed to listen to. How do I stay on the right path? In order to answer this question, uh, we're going to open up to Matthew. Uh, we're actually going to start in Matthew chapter 2, but the majority is going to be Matthew chapter 4. There's something that I wanted to point out to you, okay? You guys uh, who have been with me for a while, we've been going through the Old Testament. One of the great things about Matthew, okay, is Matthew wrote his gospel for a Jewish audience. And what's great about the Jewish audience is they were very familiar with the stories of the Old Testament. And so if you guys have been hanging out with me for a while, you guys are also familiar with the stories of the Old Testament. And so a lot of this stuff should come alive for you. And one of the things that Matthew does in his gospel is he says that is, is he compares Jesus with Israel. Over and over and over again, Israel is called the Son of God. Okay, the nation of Israel is called the Son of God. And so is Jesus. And he, and he starts putting these things together. So all the way back in Matthew chapter 2, we actually talked about this a little bit last week. Remember when Jesus was an infant? And they took him to Egypt because Herod wanted to kill whoever was supposed to be the king of kings and the lord of lords. And so they went off to Egypt. And, and, and watch what Matthew says here. Matthew chapter 2 verse 14. And he, meaning Joseph, 
rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. Verse 15, And they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. Now what's interesting is, is that Matthew was quoting uh, uh, somebody who was talking about Israel. That Israel was, was called out of Egypt and Israel was called his son. But in the same way he's saying Jesus is the better Israel. Jesus fulfills all of the things that Israel was supposed to fulfill. And so we're going to skip to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Remember Jesus has just been baptized. That was kind of a big moment. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now that should hurt your theology a little bit. The Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, led Jesus to be tempted by the devil. And a lot of times we think to ourselves, oh, I'm being tempted. It's the devil. But maybe God is allowing you to be tempted. I didn't think God did such things. Well, let's continue to read. So Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit after his baptism into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse 2. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hangry. Now what's interesting about this, for those who are my Old Testament buffs, how many years did Israel spend in the, in, in the desert? 40 years. Just like Jesus spent 40 days. Okay? So you're seeing the parallels. Matthew wants to point out to his audience the parallels between Israel and Jesus. Verse 3. And the tempter came to him and, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, I'm going to say something. That may sound weird for a pastor to say. But I, I, I kind of love Satan here, right? Because Satan is like, typical, like the typical bad guy. He's like, hey, I don't know that you're really the son of God. If you're the son of God, why don't you prove it to me by turning these, these stones into bread? Now, I want to remind you where Jesus is at. 40 days and 40 nights... He has had no food. He's fasted for 40 days, 40 nights. Some of you guys are barely holding on till lunch today. Alright? So imagine 40 days. How, how would you be mentally in 40 days? In fact, uh, Satan probably said, uh, you know, this is not really right for me to mess with you when you're, when you're at this state. Why, why don't you fix yourself some bread with those rocks over there? I mean, you are the Son of God. You should be able to do it. Verse 4. But Jesus answered, It is written, meaning, I'm quoting from the Old Testament, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Interesting. And what you're going to find through this is that every time Satan tries to tempt Jesus, he's going to quote him some scripture. Now what, what, what does this mean? Uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, he was actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And so we're going to read just a, a few verses from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And God was actually explaining to Israel why it was that they were that he allowed them to be hungry in the desert. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 1. The whole commandment that I command you today you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land that Yahweh swore to give to your forefathers, right? Trust my words. I'm about to send you into the promised land. Trust me when I tell you things. Verse 2, he says, And you shall remember the whole way that Yahweh your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness and that he might humble you, 
testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now let's just kind of pause here for a second. Just like Jesus is being tested in the wilderness by Satan, so was the nation of Israel tested. How were they tested? Verse 3. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives <clears throat> by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. What God was trying to explain to the nation of Israel was this, okay? Bread is not the ultimate worry that you have in your life. You don't need to worry about bread anymore. And he proved it to them because for 40 years they didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. But every day God provided manna for them to eat. And so what he was trying to say is, you belong to me now. And so trust my word. If I say that I'm going to protect you, if I say that I'm going to provide for you, trust me. What does that look like today? Well, when God called Michelle and I to plant a church, it's like, okay, great. Where, how are we going to feed our family? That was the big, one of the biggest concerns. That was one of the reasons why Michelle was like, no, we're not doing this. And finally, Michelle and I as a couple, we said, you know what? We're going to trust in the word of the Lord that he is going to provide for us. If he says that this is what he wants us to do, he will provide. And he has. So back to our story. Jesus says, well, you're tempting me just like Israel was tempted. And I'm not going to be tempted by you. I'm going to live on the word of God. Ooh. The devil says, oh, you want to, you know scripture. I know scripture too. And so in verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city, which is Jerusalem. And then he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Verse 6, and he said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Oh, you want him to commit suicide? Why would he do that? For it is written, now he quotes scripture, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You think that you're like, like Israel. Well, this prophecy was about Israel in the book of Psalms. Let me open up to that real quick. Psalm chapter 91, starting in verse 9. This is a promise that God made to Israel. Because you have made Yahweh your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. Verse 10, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. This was a promise by God. Because you have trusted me, I will protect you. Verse 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And so Satan actually quotes this to Jesus and says, oh, you're like the, the nation of Israel? Well, this was a promise. If you really are the son of God, throw yourself off. Let everybody see the angels rescuing you. Jesus, I think, thought about that for a moment. Verse 7, And then Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That was actually another verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. This was uh, to Israel. You shall not put Yahweh your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. What happened at Massa? Remember, God had, had told them that he was going to provide for them food and water in the desert. Well, they had gone a day or two without food and they were, uh, I'm sorry, without water and they were getting really thirsty. 
And they started complaining to Moses. Hey, we haven't had anything to drink. And Moses kept saying, yeah, but God said that he was going to provide. Just be patient. They said, you know what? We're not going to go <clears throat> another step unless you provide water for us. So Moses prayed. And God said, okay, go strike that rock with your staff. And he struck the rock with the staff and water came out and everybody was able to drink. But they were told, you sinned against God because you didn't trust his word. Don't test God. Don't test him. And so when Satan used that to, to try to get Jesus to jump off the building to say, hey, prove it. He goes, I don't need to prove it. I shouldn't test my God. So in verse 8, again, the, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And there's not really a mountain that high, but whatever. He was, a, he was able to, to make Jesus see all of the nations of the earth at that time. Verse 9, And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, I don't believe that Satan really understood what Jesus was all about because uh, the New Testament actually says uh, if the powers of darkness would have known what Jesus was really up to, they would have never killed him. But unbeknownst to Satan, I believe this was the greatest temptation for Jesus. Because all the other nations were under the authority of the powers of darkness. The only nation that was under the authority of God was Israel at that time. Jesus' mission was to reclaim all of those other nations. I believe that Jesus knew that the path was going to take him to the cross. And here's Satan, not even fully understanding what the temptation is. He says, man, you don't have to go through anything. I know why you're here. And I'll give it to you. All those powers of darkness, they answer to me. If you would just bow down and worship me, I'll give it to you. You can have it. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and, uh, and him... Uh, I'm sorry. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. This is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy, it says to the nation of Israel in verse 14, You shall not go after or follow after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. Verse 15, For Yahweh your God is in your midst, is a jealous God, lest the anger of Yahweh your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from the face of the earth. There's no compromising when it comes to God. You can't worship God and worship other stuff at the same time. It's only Him. And so what's interesting is, is that here's Satan. He wants to try to get Jesus to worship Him. And he'll give Him all this other stuff. But that's the problem. All these other people are worshiping these other gods. Baal, Ashtoreth. All these other things. And, and in our culture today, people are still worshiping other gods. And we can make it metaphorical. And Okay, they, they worship like their stuff. But like, we live in Miami. There's Santeria, there's witchcraft. Like there's all kinds of things that people are worshiping. And Jesus said, no, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not taking the easy way out, Satan. I'm going to do it the right way. Be gone. What's interesting is in verse 11, then the devil left him. Wow. I want you guys to understand, Satan is way more powerful than you think that he is. He's really powerful. In fact, if you bow down and worship him, he will give you stuff. 
But it's not going to make your life better. It makes it worse. But here's the interesting thing. Here's Jesus, the Son of God, and, and he's in this weakened state. And what does he say to Satan? Be gone. Get out of here. And Satan obeys him. Then the devil left him, and behold, check this out, angels came and were ministering to him. The very scripture that, that Satan was quoting about how God would send his angels, even that verse came true. So the word of God always comes true. It's just not going to happen on your time or on Satan's time. It's going to happen on God's time. So how do I stay on the right path? Knowing the word of God will keep you on the right path. We see that Jesus, the very son of God, used scripture to make sure that he stayed on the right path. And here's what I'm going to say. If Jesus needed to know scripture, how much more do you and I need to know scripture? In fact, um, I, I, the last verse that I want to read to you, this, this is our key verse for today. It's actually from Joshua chapter 1. I actually, uh, I named my son Joshua because this scripture had such an impact on my life that I wanted it to have an impact on his life too. That's why I named him Joshua. In the verse, in, in, in verse 7, which I didn't put up on the screen, it talks about the path. It says, do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Don't veer off the path. Okay, well, how do I stay on the path? Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Knowing the Word of God keeps you on the right path. And so I know that for some of us here, it's like, well, wait a minute, I'm just starting this thing. I don't know anything. It's okay, start studying. You know what? If this is your first time at church, just start coming to church. Try to teach you guys how to read scripture. I show you how to read it even when I'm preaching. You can go to a, 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 a Bible study. Lisa's got a Bible study all the time that will teach you how to read scripture. Uh, Gabe and Sarah are always teaching the apologetics club. We're, we're going to be doing uh, uh, how, how to read the Bible for all it's worth. There's, get involved in that stuff. You say, but yeah, Todd, I, I need to know how to be on the, the path right now. There are some people in here. Most of them have white hair. Some of them don't have any hair. <laughs> but there are some people who are in here today who know the Bible. And you should be getting to know them really, really well. Because... When you're not sure what path you're supposed to be on, those would be the people. And you say, listen, I, I don't want to hear your opinion, Chuck. I want to know what the Bible says about this. And Chuck would be happy to tell you what the scripture says about that. Knowing the word of God keeps you on the right path. So the next time you find yourself distracted... Go back to the Word of God. If you find yourself in your old habits, and you go, how do I break out of these old habits? Start learning the Word of God. And you know what's funny is, is that when you start reading the Word of God for yourself, it's this crazy thing that happens. It seems like just about every time you read it, it was like, oh, God knew I was going through this today. How did He know that, right? Like, wow, this is crazy. And God will do that. When you need to hear from Scripture, he'll, he'll lead you to the right Scripture. When there's too many paths, when there's too many opinions, 
Find some people that you can trust that know the Word of God because knowing the Word of God keeps you on the right path. When I was younger, I was a counselor at the Homestead Job Corps Center. And my boss was one of my best friends. In fact, he's still to this day a very, very good and close friend of mine. And um, when I was younger, uh, I was... I had more energy, so can you imagine this with more energy? Like I was angry all the time, everybody was an idiot, you know, one of those things. So we would go to this meeting once a week and it had the CEO. You could ask, so my, my friend is uh, Scott Parker, he was my boss. And still to this day, there was this one meeting where the CEO was an idiot too. And, um, <laughs> And so he was telling us how to do counseling. The guy's never, I mean, he's never done counseling in his life. But he's trying to tell us how to do our jobs. And so he's telling us, well, you know, this is what I want you to do. And so, um, and I'll sanitize it for church. I said, so, uh, and this is in the middle of the meeting. I said, so basically you just want us to blow smoke up their butts. <laughs> and Scott thought that was the funniest thing ever, right? Well, Scott and I started to uh, read scripture together. He said, hey, why don't we have a Bible study? So we started going through the book of Proverbs. So him and I would, would read a proverb, you know, a, a chapter of Proverbs a day. And then once a week we would get together and discuss the, the Proverbs that stuck out to us. So one particular week, I read the proverb that said, Do not be friends with an angry man, lest you learn his ways. And when I read that proverb, I was embarrassed. Because that proverb wasn't advice for me, it was advice for Scott. And it was basically telling Scott, don't be friends with Todd because he's an angry man. I was so embarrassed. I, I, was, I was afraid to go to the meeting with him that week. Well, after that, I realized, man, there needs to be a change in my life. I need to be doing stuff differently. So I found this other proverb. Yeah, some people have like really deep like uh, life verses. Mine is Proverbs 10, 19. It says, when words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. In other words, it's shut up, Todd. <laughs> and so I started going to the meeting with my Bible. Not because I was super spiritual. Everybody thought I was becoming like this super spiritual guy. I wasn't. I just would open up to that scripture. And whenever they would start getting me angry with the stupid things that they were saying. I would go, when words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. And I would just say it over and over and over. And I, and I started keeping my mouth shut. And between, between people seeing me reading the Bible. And me keeping my mouth shut. They started respecting me more. And they started coming to me for advice. It was weird. And it was at that moment God showed me the power of knowing the Word of God and how it can change your life. The one thing I wanted people to do was just listen to me. But when I was screaming it, nobody wanted to listen. But when I kept my mouth shut like Scripture told me to, all of a sudden everybody wanted to hear what I had to say. And it was at that point that I started saying, you know what? If that little proverb is going to make a difference in my life, let me go back to the Old Testament. Just like I've been taking you guys through the Old Testament. And I pray that God has been changing your life through it as he's changed mine. Because knowing the word of God keeps you on the right path. Let's read together Luke chapter 11, verse 28. And here's what's interesting. Jesus makes it very simple for us. This is so simple. What does he say? He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. It's simple. Just hear the word of God and obey it. It's not easy, but it's simple. Because knowing the word of God keeps you on the right path. Let me have everyone bow your heads, close your eyes, nobody looking around. I want to give an opportunity for anybody here who perhaps needs to say yes to Jesus today. 
And so I'm going to, with everybody's head bowed, every eye closed, it's really important that everybody does that. You'll know why in a moment. I want to explain what saying yes to Jesus even means. Saying yes to Jesus means understanding that God is perfect and God is holy, but I am not perfect and I am not holy. And my imperfection and my unholiness is what the Bible calls sin. And sin separates us from a perfect and holy God. In fact, our sin violates the very nature of who God is. And so the Bible says that we are hopelessly separated from Him. There is no amount of good things that you can do. There is no amount of money that you can give to charity. There is no amount of church that you can attend that can fix your relationship with God, your sin problem with God. But if you've missed out on everything else I've said here today, do not miss out on these next few words. But God loves you anyway. You say, but Todd, how, how do you know that God loves me? You don't know the things that I've done in this life. And you're right, I don't. But what I do know is that God sent His only precious child to die for you and for me. Now perhaps you have people in this life who love you, but I can guarantee you this, there is nobody in this life that loves you enough to allow their precious child to die for you. That is the unbelievable and unmistakable love of God. The story goes that God the Father sent His Son Jesus from heaven to earth. That Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I are not capable of living. But then at the end of His time here on earth, instead of just going back up into heaven, which is what He deserved to do, He laid down His life on a cross. He... The reason why he laid down his life on a cross was so that you and I, if we believe in him, our sins are placed on that cross. And his righteousness, which means his right relationship with God the Father, is placed on us. The best part of this story is that when the only precious child of God places his identity on you, he gives you the right to become a precious child of God yourself. So there's some of us who are here today that we have other gods. But God is calling us home. He says, I love you so much, I was willing to give you my son all I'm asking for is for you to just accept that gift. So if you're here today and you're ready to say yes to Jesus, you're ready to become a child of God, in a moment I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And this is why every head is bowed and every eyes closed because I don't want you to feel embarrassed about raising your hand. The only two people in the room that will know will be you and me. I just need to know who I'm praying with. So if you're here today and you need to say yes to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand right now. Anybody here? Amen. If you raise your hand, just pray with me. Say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe in you. I believe that you came from heaven to earth. That you lived the perfect life. That you died on a cross for my sins. That you rose three days later just to prove that you're God. Jesus, come into my life. Change me from the inside out. And Lord, for the rest of us who have already said yes to Jesus, help us to know the Word of God. Help us to get passionate about the Word of God. Because knowing the Word of God is what's going to keep us on the right path. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.